Our drive for drink has led us away from the East Coast and into the heart of America. So from here to the Rockies, it's all beer and brats as far as the eye can see, right? Wrong. The Midwest has a long and storied wine tradition. The story there is that uh, Ohio was once the largest wine producing state, thanks to Nicholas Longworth. Um, and it was all Catawba, and he would make a sparkling wine, a white wine, and all this. Learning about Catawba uh, and this wine that I knew to be pink and sweet, and it wasn't always that way, and it was really kind of a calling to recreate this wine and try to see, you know, what, what capabilities that were here. Could you tell us a little bit about the famous picture there? Yeah, and it's actually from Harper's Weekly. Uh, of Longhorse Vineyards, uh, that would have been 1858, 1859. As we sit, so we're downtown Cincinnati, the northern part of Over the Rhine. Um, it is just the hill literally east of us. Nicholas Longworth, he was kind of a revolutionary thinker. He had tried um, himself with European varieties and didn't have success. This country has vines all around us. Um, and that's always been a notable characteristic um, of this country, and so he became very interested in the cultivation of the native grape. He received cuttings of a grape called Catawba uh, from John Adlam, and he was really happy uh, with the grape itself. Catawba is one of the most historically important American heritage grapes. It's an accidental hybrid grape with both American and European DNA. Its mother was the American fox grape, Vitis labrusca, that much was always clear from the foxy taste in its skins. But in the 1990s, with genetic testing, scientists were able to discover its other parent. The father is... The Great Bordeaux White Grape... Semyon! Nicholas Longworth did a couple things to maximize Catawba's potential. By removing the skins, he could make a white wine with barely a hint of fox grape flavor. And by long aging in neutral wood, the acidic and savory flavors came into harmony. Ultimately, he cultivated Catawba throughout these hills. Uh, there were vineyards literally flanking the city uh, in pretty much every direction. So Cincinnati, um, in terms of kind of population growth, was really driven by large um, populations of German immigrants. Um, and they came, they're very skilled uh, and very hard workers, and also drink wine and beer, which is also notable. Uh, but that really kind of put its imprint on the city in terms of our identity. They came in um, and they had skill sets um, from their Rhineland and they brought that here. And uh, in many cases, Cincinnati doesn't look that different from notable German cities and uh, that were largely hills and the city itself is a space and surrounded by those hills. He saw an opportunity uh, with the Germans that were here that, you know, had come from a place that looked very similar and, you know, they had the means um, and the knowledge to cultivate hillsides. That's what they did. We mentioned, you know, the Germans were immigrants, uh, but a lot of them were women that were actually tending to the vineyards. And so he ultimately ended up becoming famous for his still dried Catawba uh, as well as sparkling Catawba. Um, and both of those were widely exported, which is amazing to think about uh, Cincinnati wine being, you know, other places of the world. That's a pretty cool thing. He was amazing at communicating and record keeping. And so year to year, you could get a sense of the vintages. By the late 1850s, uh, there was a lot of losses around blight in general, which would have most notably probably been black rot. Kind of the culmination of conditions in the vineyard with disease pressure that they didn't know how to handle. Fast forward, you know, early 1860s, we're on the brink of the Civil War, uh, and labor is changing because in any wartime period, you don't have availability of people to go and do, you know, intensive things. And I'm sure they were probably more committed to raising food than they were wine grapes. But I think had Longworth, you know, survived through the war, I, th I think there would have been a sustaining presence. I have no doubt about it because cultivating vines here was never easy. I think it was just bad timing for a lot of things at once, quite frankly. So unfortunately, 
by the early 1860s, um, wine production here was really dropping off. We moved out west, um, worked in the industry out west. We actually were in uh, Portland, Oregon, and there's old pal books there and came across uh, a book there and, and pals that talked quite a bit about Cincinnati wine heritage and there's all these weird callings that uh, kind of brought us back. So the whole premise um, with the Skeleton Root has been really exploring um, growing sites here, grape varieties, what made sense for true classical wine um, styles because we do not add a bunch of junk to our wine and so um, really they have to be varieties that you know, make a wine that um, is worth drinking innately. We tend to be more cool climate. We can be warm and then cold again. And so that's particularly challenging when you're a plant because you have no idea what's going on. Our inaugural harvest was in 2014. 2014 was also the year of the notable polar vortex for the Midwest and the Northeast. So the great varieties that did bear fruit that year, so Norton, for instance, Catawba, uh, they were there and doing well, despite everything that happened. And so while we do work with vinifera and we do raise vinifera, we're very much committed to these American heritage grapes. American heritage grapes in general, their chemistries are different. You know, this isn't Cabernet, um, this isn't Chardonnay, and it shouldn't be. You know, there's approaches in style uh, that need to be made based on that, and it's about what you line them up with as well. It's, you know, if it's not a couch sipping wine for you, that's great. Whether it's acidic, tannic, or dry, or sweet, or however that comes across to you, uh, it's really going to be balanced by what you're consuming it with or not. We are this like largely German heritage city. Fatty meats and this porkopolis, we're the city of pigs. It lines up beautifully next to a wine like Tava or a wine like Norton where you need something that you know helps cleanse your palate and something that can really stand up to those foods that are so dominating. More and more we get folks that, you know, read about it or heard a rumor of it and they're here because of that. You know, it's an incredible past that we have uh, and it's cool to share that too because when we lose our heritage, you start to lose a place. Um, Cincinnati is a really precious place because of all of these things that made it what it is today. And so the skeleton root just pays homage to the roots that were once here. We didn't want you know, the namesake to be tied to any one person. It's this lost history that we have. I mean, our logo is um, emulating head trained vines and canes and tendrils. And we have this place that was once hillsides covered in what looked like crazy shrubs, you know, uh, that were bearing fruit, that were making notable Cincinnati wine. That's awesome.